Fellow moderators, worthy opponents, brethren and sisters in Christ, I'm truly happy to have the opportunity of coming to this pulpit again to deny the things that my brother has stated, the most of them, to say the least of it, some things we can agree on. He agrees that there's a kingdom in existence. Well, I do too. The only point is, when shall it come into existence? He denies the return of the Lord to set up a kingdom. The days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, shall not be destroyed, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and they shall stand forever. Five different meanings of the word kingdom in the Bible. You've got to distinguish which one of the kingdoms he's having reference to. There's the kingdom of God, rule over all, kingdom of Israel, kingdom of David, kingdom of the church, kingdom of salvation, and the kingdom of the millennium set forth in the Bible. We pray for the millennial kingdom in our regular prayer, Lord's model. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He has stated time and time again that David is sitting on, that Jesus is sitting on David's throne. He has never given us a scripture that says he now is sitting on David's throne. The scripture that's in there, the Lord says he sit down with his father on his throne. David's throne never was in heaven. It was in Jerusalem. And when the Lord returns to this earth, he's going to sit on David's throne because he's the heir to it. Next heir to the throne of Israel. He did not take the heirship when he was here on earth because of the simple fact he didn't plan to reign on earth when he came the first time. And by the way, he said concerning the Lord, Jesus said, I will return in John 14 and receive you unto myself that where I am ye may be also. Jesus shall return to this earth, and when he returns to this earth, he's coming for his children and to resurrect them or to translate them to meet him yonder in the air. Then he comes back to the division of the New Testament. Jesus said in Luke 24, 44, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be written, uh, fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Three divisions of the Old Testament. Law, first five books of the Bible. Prophets, the prophetical books. Psalms, the poetical books. Psalms, uh, Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the poetical books. Now he referred to the Psalms of the New Testament. By the way, you can't get your scripture for musical instruments in the Old Testament without referring to the Psalms. But the Psalms remain as our rule of faith and practice. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the Psalms were done away. We're commanded in Scripture that he quoted in Ephesians 5.19 and in Colossians 3.16. And by the way, he referred to instruments. I don't know what in the world you fellas are going to do when the trumpet sounds. Because the dead shall be raised, and we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in there. It's a musical instrument in the trumpet. And what are you going to do when you get to heaven and are associated with those that harp on their harps? Take it or leave it. By the way, I want him to give me the scripture where it says the apostles were selected to execute the will of Christ. I deny it. It isn't in there. Will of God. He willeth not the death of any, but that all should come to repentance. That's the will of God. There's no such thing, and incidentally, he refers to uh, Calvinism. Calvinism doesn't believe in uh, conditions. They believe in unconditional salvation. And he says the Bible was written to Christians. I challenge him to prove it. The book tells me that it's written to the Church of God at Corinth, Church of God at Ephesus, Church of God at so-and-so. 
It definitely was written to churches. By the way, I'll give you seven of them over in the book of Revelation, and all of them just had one pastor. If you'll turn over to the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, you'll find seven churches of Asia, and not a one of them has a double pastor like you guys have. They all have one pastor under the church of God, the angel of the church at Ephesus, the angel of the church at Theratai, under the angel of the church at Pergamos, angel of the church at the Laodicea, all in the singular. Double dog dare you to look at it. It's available. Talked about he didn't lust. The lust is a strong desire, good or bad. Men do lust after other, and things that cause lust are things that I mentioned in the beginning. He's referred to three times to me running off with a 16-year-old girl. Well, why did he use the illustration and ask if I commit adultery and go on and on and on? Beloved, I'm not going to run off with a 16-year-old girl, but I repeat again, if I do, Romans 8, 28 says, it will work for good. What does he do? He lays the lash on a person for his sins. God does not allow his children to get by without paying for their sins. All must pay for their sins. Throughout the entire well, there's very few things that he presented as new material in this particular, but he talked about falling from grace. There's only one place in the Bible where it says you can fall from grace, and that's Galatians 5 and 4. And you know how he says? You that are justified by law are fallen from grace. Well, now, how many are fallen from grace? Paul said that there's no man justified by law. Two times he says it in the book of Galatians, that no man is justified by law. That's the only kind of person that can fall from grace. And incidentally, you can't fall from the grace of God. If you've ever gotten the grace of God, you can't fall for it, from it. By the way, do the things that God give you, are they short-lived or are they eternal? What about the seed? He talked about seed. Seed of God remaineth in each child of God that's born of God. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God, born out of God. What kind of seed does God plant in the believer that has repented of his sins and trusted in Christ? He gives him his seed. The seed of God remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born out of God. Now... See what you can do with that kind of sin. Is the seed of God Almighty short-lived? The book says he's eternal. Like begets like. You don't believe in eternal salvation. You don't believe in Mark 16, 16. I emphasize it again. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You believe he shall be saved if he doesn't fall from grace. And he teaches you plainly he can fall from grace. That isn't what the book teaches. God teaches eternal salvation. If you can be saved today and lost next week, that's not eternal salvation. That's one week salvation. If you can be saved today and lost next summer, that's not eternal salvation. That's not forever and ever. That's not everlasting. That's one year, or one week, one month. I don't care if it's a thousand years hence, and you can still fall from grace. That's not everlasting. It's not eternal. It's one thousand. The salvation that God gives never ends. The salvation and the seed out of which we've been born never ends. But it's everlasting. It's eternal. Thanks be unto God for the same. I want to refer to some words last evening that I dealt with, and incidentally, the Almighty God has prepared a lot of things for us, and he gave a lot of things for us. In the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he doesn't believe in those, 
because those that were said were saved couldn't be saved before the death of Christ, before he gave his blood. They look forward to the blood, and we look back to the blood. If you don't think the folk were saved in the Old Testament by the blood of Jesus, look over to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and saved by faith. Not a one of them is stated about being saved by baptism or by law. There's no salvation by law. You teach that there's salvation by law in the Old Testament. No such thing. Salvation in the Old Testament, same as it is in the New. Over in the book of Acts, chapter uh, 43rd uh, verse of the 12th chapter of, uh, of Acts, where the Lord was speaking, or where uh, the apostle of Peter was speaking, going concerning to the 11th chapter, 10th chapter, I'll get it in a minute. Acts 10, 43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believe shall receive remission of sins. To whom was he speaking? About whom was he speaking? All the prophets were saved the same way that we're saved today. And you talk about remission, they received remission because they believed. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In every case, to him give all the prophets witness that whosoever is baptized, whosoever keeps the law, no, none of those things, but whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Same thing as it's given, you should have for remission of sins. The word Lord, Master, in the books Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 244 times. I want to say again, I do not appreciate the teaching that's given to the world that Jesus Christ isn't sufficient to be able to do what he said he would do. He came to the world to seek and to save sinners, and he could not save anybody until he died. Well, what about the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews? How was Abel saved? He was saved by faith. How was Noah saved? He was saved by faith. The ark didn't save him. The ark was a type of what's given. Those that were, and by the way, those that were in the ark were the only ones that didn't perish in water. Those that were in the water died. Those that were in the water died. There's no life in the water for a human being. The only thing you harp on time and time again, baptize, be baptized and is saved. That's literal water. The Lord says, if you take the water that I shall give, the living water, water of life, that's the kind of water that's saved. But anyhow, back to the business of water. John 3, 5. I don't know why it goes to John 3, 5. That's three years before the day of Pentecost. And uses it continually. But that's under law, according to him. Okay. Covenant, New Testament, is to be kept by whom? Apostles had no authority to execute it. When they died, what happened to them? They're not able to pay a pass on from one to other. The authority of the Almighty God, it's a church he was speaking to, and not to the individual apostles. Thank God for the apostles, but they were not given the authority to execute the will of the Lord. Another thing, you don't even have today the written will of God, according to you, for your church, because it didn't start till Pentecost. The written word of God, uh, will of God wasn't given then. It was a number of years after Christ died before the written will was ever got uh, given. All that they had was the word of the apostles or the prophets or the church members. It was not given in writing for many, many years. And right close to the end of the century before the New Testament was completed. How did they get the law of God? The Spirit of God led those that had been given the Spirit while Jesus was here to give his word 
by mouth, just exactly like it was given when the Lord was on earth. How was his law given? It was given by word of mouth. And the word of mouth came from the apostles and Jesus Christ, the 70 missionaries that were sent out. Such folks as that gave the word of the Lord to the people. He sent them forth to preach. By the way, he ordained them and sent them forth to preach. I learned something this afternoon that I didn't realize it was in there. Did you know when the Lord went up to the mountain, I've given it to you before, but my brother has consistently left it out. Everywhere Jesus went, the church went with him. He called them to follow him. Every place he went, the twelve apostles and the disciples and others went with him, place after place. When he went up to the mountain and called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. He ordained them and sent them forth to preach and told them what to preach. Now hear me. He came down from the mountain and with his disciples. If you want that, look over in the book of Luke and start with chapter uh, 6 and start in with verse 12 and read down there. And the company of his disciples... The word that's used there for that company is the same that used when he fed the thousand and said there was five thousand. Same word. There was at least five thousand of his disciples down at the bottom of the hill also waiting for him with those that came down with him. All you have to do is look and read it. The word oaklos is used. That's the word for thousand, or um, 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 multitude, if you please. Oakloy, multitudes. And there are three words that are used in that passage of Scripture, and either one, of, either one of them has reference to a great number, and one of them is 10,000 in existence. Where? Talk about the Lord having a bunch of uh, disciples to follow him. It's given there in the language from whence it's taken. Well, you don't want to talk about the Greek, but by the way, our Bible was translated out of the Greek. Only Bible that they had when Christ was on earth was the Greek Old Testament was translated into it. Either the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek uh, Testament of the Old Testament. They didn't get his word that he gave while here on earth until many, many, many years after. They received it the same way as they received it before he died on Calvary by word of mouth from Christ and from his apostles. That's all in the world. They had a way of getting it. Okay. The word Lord is used 244 times. Was he a master of all that he had? Let me tell you something. I give the Lord credit for being a master like it's said concerning him. You don't. He's not a master of anything if he couldn't carry out what he said unto the disciples. He commanded them. He had authority to do it. Christos means he's commissioned, and it's used 58 times in the four Gospels. Jesus Christ was commissioned, and he said the only gave to the world what his Father gave to him to give. The word repent is found 16 times in the Gospels. The word save, sozo, or saved 53 times in the Gospel. When the Lord said unto the woman of the well about her salvation, if you'd received the water that I should give you, it should be a new well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay? And when he said to the woman that came into the supper where they were, she was crying concerning her sins, washed his feet, dried them of the hairs of her head. He said, Thy faith hath saved thee. H-A-T-H. -H. If that isn't past tense, I don't know what it is. Thy faith hath saved thee. She was already repenting. She was crying. She was troubled. She was sorrowful. That's what repenting is. Repentance is not saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Devils have that kind of faith. And that's what you profess. All you got to do, Alexander put it out, your, his successors all do the same thing. Just say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you're el eligible to be baptized. It takes more than that. That's just the beginning. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must have faith enough in the God to believe that he is and that Christ is, because if you don't believe Christ is, you can't be saved anyhow. All right. This to you, old word, believe or believe, 181 times in the four Gospels. I don't have to just depend on one word, or one verse, Mark 16, 16. But, beloved, every Baptist that repents of his sins and believes and is baptized, he's saved, just the same as you are. And, by the way, ours were saved, starting with John the Baptist, all the way through that's all the kind of baptism you have. It's all the kind that the apostles had at the day of Pentecost. They didn't get any baptism on the day of Pentecost for them. The church that was there, 115 in number, and the apostles in that group, and to whom was the 3,000 added? Added unto them. To them what? Added to the church that was already there, present, waiting a number of days. They had waited since the Lord had left this world. He told them to go into Jerusalem and wait until you're being endued with power from on. Now, the coming of the Spirit is not the organization of the church. They had the Spirit already. I gave you a number of times, and you can find many, many times in the Scriptures of the four Gospels where they had the Spirit. Jesus was conceived when the Holy Spirit o'ershadowed Mary. And when he was immersed, the Holy Spirit lit on him in the bodily shape of a dove. After he was immersed, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And time after time after time, the book tells of the Spirit leading. And the Lord told the disciples while he was here, when you're brought before the magistrates, don't think about what you're going to say. It'll be given you in that hour by the Spirit. Now, the very idea of denying those things, if you deny them, you know what you're doing? You're denying God Almighty's Word. And that's not faith in God. That isn't faith in God. Okay. Baptized verb is found 83 times in the Scripture. Baptized noun is found 12 times. And the name, baptized, 14 times. And you speak about the name. Beloved, it's the only name in the book that's found in the nominative case. Name case. Now, the Church of Christ is not a name. And it comes from the expression, Churches of Christ. You know what I'm talking about. And churches of Christ, the singular, is not the church of Christ because there isn't any such thing. Churches of Christ simply in the plural. And when I asked him for the name, the church of Christ, you know what he gave me? The church of God at Corinth or wherever it was. That's not a name. That tells you it's a church that belonged to the city of Corinth. Church at Ephesus, one located in Ephesus. Church of God at Smyrna. Church of God here and Church of God there. Church of the Macedonians. Number of passages like that. Churches of Judea. Churches of Macedonia. Churches of Asia. But not one of them is the name. Okay. Then the word Caruso preached 32 times in the book. God ordained those 12 men and sent them forth to preach. He also sent 70 missionaries out to preach. Well, did they do it? They preached and returned and gave a report of the activities to the Lord. Let me tell you something. When God tells them to do something right there on the job to see that they do it, I guarantee you they did it. And they wanted to do it. When God called me to preach, they 
set me aside with, by the presbytery that I should go preach. I hit the ground running, and I've been at it ever since. And I intend if the Lord will let me preach till he returns again. The word gospel. Two words for gospel. One of them, uh, this one's euangelizo. Seventy-eight times it's used in the book. And the God of heaven gave them the gospel to carry on to uh, the world. Apostolos, the follow work. They followed him. The book says they followed him 200 times plus in regular services, day in and day out, 78 times in the book. Oklos, multitude, great multitude, number nine, so on, many, many times. What has my brother said concerning these? Oh, I believe all of that. That's not the answer, thank you. Not the answer to it. I believe all of those. Well, if you do, you'd be a Baptist. Luke twenty four forty seven, And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He says that tells us that the church is to begin at Jerusalem. No, it didn't say that. It said the preaching of the gospel to all nations was to begin at Jerusalem. The first time the gospel was preached at Jerusalem to all nations. Now, it wasn't the first gospel sermon. If you look to Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Christ, and that many other things that I mentioned too, about the gospel being existent 78 times in the scriptures of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the beginning of Jerusalem was the preaching to all nations. Two commissions were given by the Lord while he was on earth. One was a limited commission. That limited commission was to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And by the way, we have some Gentiles that were saved in the Old Testament. It wasn't only given to the Old Testament, but the Old Testament were servants were responsible for carrying it to the world himself. You know, when Jonah was called to go preach to Nineveh, he was a Jew. But the Ninevites were not Jewish. And he rebelled against going there. And incidentally, there was a whole city of Gentiles that were saved. And the Lord honored that. In the book of Matthew, he said that to those Pharisees and Christ, scribes that he was preaching to, that the people of Nineveh shall rise in judgment and condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Well... What about Moses? Is he in heaven? What about Elijah? Is he in heaven? Neither one of them lived till after Christ died. He hadn't died when they were saved. But while he was here, he appeared with them on the Mount of Transfiguration. How'd they get saved? Oh, saved by law. I challenge you to give me one passage of Scripture that proves it. Nobody's saved by law. None of those were saved by law. The only thing that kept them from dying was the mercy of God because the physical law required the penalty of death, but not the law of the Almighty God. He's the one that could condemn the individual to hell. Fear not him that can destroy the body. After that, there's no more that he can do, but rather fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. Ten commandments carried the penalty of sin, but it was a penalty of death. It was for the breaking of the physical law, not the thing pertaining to his salvation. Now, the word preached is used 32 times before Pentecost, and the word gospel is used 15 times before Pentecost. And yet you tell me that it was the first gospel sermon. Acts 2.38, you see that over yonder on the card. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I have it diagrammed yonder. Repent is a verb, and the second person, first, aorist, passive, and it's an imperative in the active voice. All right. Second person plural, ye. Ye repent. Be baptized is a verb. Third person, singular, first aorist, imperative, 
passive voice. An active voice and a passive voice cannot be joined together without destroying accountability. All scholars will give you that I have given you the truth, even Hardiman, that debated with Dr. Bogart, and I heard the debate. He had it signed in a paper that this is the actual condition as given in the Greek language, and that's where it's translated from. Now, we all know that they must agree in gender, number, and case, such like, but here it doesn't. So you don't have the same thing, and ye repent, and ye be baptized. One of them is the active voice, and it's an imperative, it's a command, and it's absolutely an imperative that you repent of your sins. First, there is past tense, corresponds to it. In the active voice, be baptized, third person singular, passive voice. I challenge any of you to prove that I've lied in it or give you the wrong information. I'm acquainted with that. Pardon me. I've been touched with studying and teaching the two languages, Hebrew and Greek, since 1939. Thank you.